Hello, everyone, and welcome to Women in Tech panel. Um, our topic today is emerging business models for music and artists. Um, and it's a little bit hard to concentrate up here because currently we can also all hear four other people. So um, we'll try our hardest. Um, my name is Arielle Hyatt. I come from New York City, and um, I run a marketing and PR firm for musicians, and we also built a platform that helps them connect to their fans. And I'm going to let everyone on this panel, first of all, it's really nice to be on a panel with three other women. This very rarely happens in the music industry. Um, we're going to start all the way on the end, and if you could give us who you are and what you do and what a day looks like for you. I think that would be a, a nice way to kick off. Sure. Um, actually, I've been here a couple of hours before at 11. I was speaking about music curation. My name is uh, Andrea Magdalena. I am head of community at Mixcloud, which is a platform for DJs, radio, podcast, radio presenters and podcasters where they can upload their uh, content, they can connect with each other, and they can use Mixcloud as a, as a marketing tool, really. Uh, and for listeners to enjoy all of this content in one go. Um, I've been working with Mixcloud for almost a year now, so not that long. So I can't say I've been in the industry for too long, but it's moving so fast that um, I feel like I've learned, like, one year has gone as 10. Um, What's your day like? What's my? What is your day like? What's a typical day in, the, in your life? Right. Well, that's that's a pretty harsh question because um, we're a very small team. We're about 12 to 15 people in total. And I say 215 because we have a couple of them working uh, part-time from uh, other countries as well. Uh, I spend most of my time uh, on email, <laughs> of course, um, because most of what I do is liaising with our partners. We have all sorts of partners from power users, as we call them. Um, they, they would be high profile artists or festivals or venues down to um, speaking to your average user, just making sure that we are connected and that we have a, an open communication channel between, uh, between us. Um, I spend my time on social media uh, quite a lot because it teaches me a lot about our audience and what they want to what they want to hear, what they want uh, from the side. Uh, I spend a lot of time with the tech team, communicating with them, making sure that I'm aware of what they're planning and that they're aware of what people are complaining about or being grateful for. So uh, basically, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of a bridge. I, I spend my time connecting things and connecting people, I guess. Thanks. Neve. Can you all hear me? Because all I, you can't, none of you, you can. You can hear me at all. Oh, there she goes. Can you hear me now? Can you all hear me now? So I'm going to hold this, <laughs> which gives me something to do with this hand. <laughs> Um, we're going to give you a hand mic. Hey, voila. I might start singing now. Um, so I'm Neva Riley. I'm uh, director of digital at Sony Music. I oversee a team of 30 digital marketing people at Sony. Um, digital producers, digital creatives, uh, digital channel managers, social media managers, um, and yeah, we we uh, we oversee all of the digital marketing for our artists in in our labels. My, I've been doing this job for six weeks, so my typical day at the moment is uh, is is pretty frantic. Um, I start the day at nine, and the first thing I do is I look at the charts. Um, the second thing I do is call the sales department and ask them if the charts are what they were expecting, if all of the sales are what they were expecting, and then I might catch up with um, my team and look at, you know, what more can we do? We would take a look at all of the analytics on our social channels. Um, we would look at whether, um, um, what, you know, traffic to our websites are, 
Um, we might, I might have a meeting with uh, somebody who's had an idea for an app, for example, who wants to see us. We would make time to see um, people at Mixcloud, people at Buddy Bounce. So we, it's, it's our job to know what all of the new cultural trends are, what the new technical developments are, so that we can um, use these to uh, really promote all our artists and make sure we're completely in touch with um, our artists' audiences and their fans. Um, and really, my team spent all of their time and all of their day having those conversations with fans, listening to fans, doing research to understand what um, fans of our audiences want and, and how we can engage them and how we can ultimately turn those fans into customers, because that obviously is the key to uh, what we do. And how many bands are you looking after? How many signed band or acts do we have? Help me, Paul. I mean, hundreds. Hundreds. We, we hundreds. So we third team of 30 for hundreds. Hundreds. Of, okay. Amazing. And not just new acts, but we have a, an enormous catalogue of superstar artists. We're constantly trying to inspire a new generation of fans for our catalogue, as you've seen with Bowie. Um, you know, he stormed the chart with his comeback. It's his first number one album in 10 years with Daft Punk, best-selling album uh, year to date fastest selling digital single. These are all catalog artists. So it's not just about, even though it's really important that we break new acts, we're also really caretaking communities for, for Bob Dylan, Michael Jackson, um, and, and all our legacy artists, as well as Tom O'Dell, Laura Mavula, and all the acts that we've broken this year. So yeah, I'm tired. <laughs> and only six weeks I'm in. tired mom. <laughs> Emma. Hello. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, yeah, that's, that's easier. Um, so my name's Emma Banye. Um, I'm one of the co-founders of Buddy Bounce, which is a platform, um, a loyalty engagement platform that allows musicians to know who their fans are as individuals, manage their communications with them all in one place and reward their core fans. So on one side, we have a, um, a website that's dedicated to fans that allows them to earn points for everything they do, all their interactions around their favorite artists online. So imagine, I'm a, I don't know, I'll say I'm a Justin Bieber fan. Um, I may tweet about him, I may watch his videos, listen to his music and a whole host of other activities. I get points for all of those things and um, I become part of a community um, around him on Buddy Bounce where I get to see all of that content aggregated together in one place. Um, I also earn badges for all of my activities. So if I'm an avid YouTube video, uh, YouTube video watcher, um, I'll earn a viewer badge. Or if, he's, if he follows me on Twitter, I'll get a groupie badge, that kind of thing. Um, and so we gamify your fan experience. On the other side, we have a powerful dashboard for um, Justin Bieber, his management team, his label, that allows them to, again, know who I am and actually um, use me, sorry, communicate to me in the best possible way, but also um, reward me if I am a, you know, a really influential or a super fan. So yeah, um, so we've been doing this for about three years now. We're a team of about six people, so a really small team. Um, and it's my day to day is just it's, it's manic. It involves <laughs> basically everything. So from communicating with fans via social channels to um, you know, talking to or, or arranging meetings with the labels, with management teams, um, talking to investors as well, because we're fundraising at the moment. Um, literally everything that you can imagine that goes into running a business. So biz dev t tasks, admin tasks, everything. And are you a developer? Um, I'm not, but I came from the tech world. So um, I started out as, um, oh, sorry, my last role was actually a project manager project manager within the tech world, so an agile scrum master. So looking after tech teams um, who are developing mobile apps, um, interactive applica TV applications, and websites. Okay. Um, I'd love to know who we're also talking to because we're a small group and you're obviously sitting here because you're interested in emerging technologies and music. And um, since there's not that many of us, who here is just here because you're interested in music and tech and it's a general conversation you want to hear? Who's a developer? Is anyone here an artist? Okay. Anyone here managing artists or currently working in the music business? And by, by that I mean doing something, working towards, yeah? Did I miss anyone? PR 
Marketing, I knew it, I can tell. Okay, <laughs> perfect. So um, we began to have a talk in the green room about sort of this general topic of emerging business models for music and artists. And I think the thing that we all came to in our quick 20 minute prep was to succeed in anything around musicians and artists, it's really about one thing. It's about engagement. It's about creating plans and systems that foster engagement with fans, between fans and artists. And we got to talking about this, this bizarre word emerging in tech because um, I think we, we all agree that there are already established platforms. The big three giants in the room obviously being Twitter, Facebook, YouTube. These are platforms that we all work on every day. It incorporates everything we do. And then there's outliers which may help or are helping individual communities um, bring up artists. So um, I wanted to dive in and talk also later on about the type of artists that are, are breaking through and how they're doing so. And we mentioned radio stars, YouTube stars now beginning to come up through the ranks. You're getting a lot of requests for YouTube stars. So um, should we talk a little bit about, about emerging? Is there, is there a platform or something specific that you like to use when marketing artists that you would consider emerging? Or do you, do you ladies stick with the big six? Um, should I start? Please. Um, well, we consider our site itself to be a platform where emerging artists can um, launch a career. We have quite a few good case studies about that, uh, one of which I've spoken about earlier on. Um, there's this collective called Selection Radio. They started uh, out in Long Beach, LA about three years ago, maybe less. Uh, Mixcloud is four years old. It's going to be four years old uh, in a couple of weeks, actually. Um, and what they did is basically they started as a couple of people passionate about radio, uh, passionate about music and um, sharing music via radio. Uh, so they, um, they did something like um, a DIY radio station. Uh, that they were doing every Saturday morning and then they were uploading all of their content on Mixcloud and then sharing it as much as possible uh, via social channels such as Twitter, Facebook, Instagram is really big in the States so um, that was a, again a main, a main asset for them but basically in terms of content, the content itself uh, they put it on Mixcloud and they built a huge fo number of uh, followers and engagement and comments and favorites and tweets and everything that you can do now because all of these platforms are so um, uh, integrated with each other. Um, so uh, yeah, right now they're, uh, they're massive, they're, they've got a label as well. Um, they're signing new artists and they're launching merch, they're getting lots of uh, merch from Pioneer. Uh, and talking to some big uh, record labels. So um, I think, I like to think that Mixcloud kind of helped them to do uh, something like that. But in terms of other um, tools that people can use, um, so let's say there's something like, um, for example, Who Sample. We're very good friends with Who Sample. Uh, we shared the office with them, actually. There's years of my childhood. I will never get <laughs> back. That's all answered on that side Yeah, now. yeah. It's an awesome tool. If uh, Basically, Who Sample helps you um, uh, check which, which samples have been used in, in uh, the tracks you like. So uh, it's an excellent tool for music discovery. And it's a really big um, um, platform for, uh, especially for hip hop lovers, uh, because they're the, usually the, uh, the ones sampling. And I'm one of them myself. Um, I mean, lovers, not samplers. <laughs> <laughs> I wish. Um, but yeah, who sample? There's also something called um, Top DJs, which is not necessarily a platform where you um, launch yourself or you promote yourself, but you can study other people uh, doing so and what works for them so they basically they aggregate all of the data from Twitter Facebook Instagram and other social social channels and they create charts for the most successful artists or DJs uh, by country by style music style that they um, that they do and that's a really good example for your bedroom DJs 
to, to look at and, and uh, learn what's happening. But overall, I think uh, the content, content is still king. So no matter which emerging platform or already established platform they use, content should be their primary focus. As I always say, content is king, but curation is queen. So, I totally agree with that. I, I too. I think you, well, considering you're a curator. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, um, I was just going to add to that. So yeah. with Body Bounce, we actually integrate with um, a number of different platforms. So obviously the big three, Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube, and those were the first three um, applications or sorry, platforms that we integrated with. And because we're such a small company, we're very agile. So we're able to move very quickly. So when it came to adding um, some of the other platforms, we looked at what off or the users of our site were using so instagram i think came next followed by tumblr because those are applications that you know uh young well predominantly sort of female uh teenagers are using and um and what we found or what you find anyway is that um when there's an api attached to it you know it, it is pretty popular because in order to actually get to that point where you're going to develop an api you've got something you've got that traction you've got something going on with your product um but we openly sort of we want to integrate with anything any any platform that um, fans are on and fans are actually sh where fans are actually showing um, so anything that's beginning to pop you, yeah you begin to any, any platform yeah. that, that fans actually use in order to um, talk about or consume anything related to their artist we we, we want to monitor we use. yeah so we've had a we've had an addition stuck in traffic this is Lily Sorry, I'm late. <laughs> um, we started off by just saying, who, please say who you are and what you do and what a day in your life looks like. And then uh, we'll, we'll stressful. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm Lily Mercer. I have a website and I'm a kind of music journalist for freelance, you know. I work, write for magazines like Clash, uh, Noisy, Written for ID. And I'm kind of starting my own magazine, which is the new excitement. Yeah, so that's my daily thing. I also have a radio show on Rinse FM, which is a weekly thing. That's 1 till 3 a.m., so listen, it's very late. <laughs> um, but I play uh, underground hip hop almost entirely unsigned artists uh, on some shows. But yeah, basically people who are kind of maybe not played on regular radio stations. So yeah, and a daily uh, routine is kind of, I guess, combining all of those things. Um, updating my blog, writing an article, uh, sorting out my magazines or editing features and then also ra planning a whole radio show um, and interviews as well that's a real strong point in my show and also the writing side of things so I've interviewed people like Nas, Mary J Blige, Wu-Tang and Pete Rock so that's kind of an average thing as well if someone's in town. That's so <laughs> average. Wow. Oh, yeah. Just hanging out. Yeah, oh, you know, great. Pete Rock, no big deal. <laughs> no, it's, it's not, I mean yeah, there's a few kind of sitting on hand moments with those kind of people but uh, yeah no that's not a regular thing but when it does come around it's really exciting. Very cool. Yeah. Okay, so um, as you know, the topic is broad, and we started off also by sort of just chatting about emerging technology versus the big three, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, how are people finding music, um, and we were just getting a little input about really what we're trying to get to with the use of any tool is, are fans engaging with artists on them? Are they using them? How are they using them? And then Neve brought up something really interesting, which is exactly the conclusion that you come to and I came to, and I'm sure you'd agree. Um, if you're a music marketer, the aim of any sort of platform that you use and any sort of emerging technology that you might become involved with comes back down to, do you control the communication between you, artist, team of artists, and fan? And the answer to that is, do you really have their email address? Um, so I'd love to talk about that. And I'm fascinated by this on so many levels because it works if you have 100 fans and it works if you have a million fans. What are some technologies you're using to capture information or techniques, tactics, tools that you're using to get email addresses from fans? Are you finding this is a new struggle? Do you have to constantly iterate to do that? And I'll sort of throw that out to all of you. And Yes. Um, yeah, uh, we have something like 12 million interactions with fans online every day. So that's like four billions in a month. And for, for Sony and for our artists, our biggest concern is how can we turn those fans into customers ultimately? 
and that's our goal is how can we you know we, we it's it's our responsibility to artists to make sure that they we can reach scale for them and we can um, you know manage their their manage that you know make it commercially viable to, to make music so what we've tried to do is is look at how can we turn those Facebook likes or you know Twitter followers or followers on Instagram, Vine, into customers. And one of the best ways to do that is to try and turn Facebook likes into email addresses. And actually there's a big opportunity there for developers. If anybody out there has ideas on how, you know, we have things like Neil Lane and Social Miner. I don't know if you've, anybody's come across any of those. Have you used those? Okay, so they're kind of CRM tools, so customer relationship management tools that are given to us. They're not that expensive, but they really, you know, they, 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 they're not... Uh, let's look at what works. The things that work are, you know, where, where there's a great brand like Spotify, iTunes, Twitter, Facebook, um, where the technology works and it's easy to use and where that brand has an association with music and has the credibility to sell music. So they're the three things that work. They're, these are why music services have succeeded and it's why some music platforms have, have failed because they haven't cracked those three things. So, so for us, having, having say a Facebook app tab which you know, maybe incentivizes people to leave their email address in exchange for a free track or for some exciting content or for perhaps you know, some meet and greet that we might do with Buddy Bounce or... Um, you know, some exciting piece of content that gives the band access, gives the fan access to the band. In, in a way, I suppose, imagine an old school fan club, you know, uh, from 20 years ago with unrivaled access to a band and amazing content. Um, and that's what, you know, we like to do with, with our followers on Facebook and any, any kind of social, social platform that exists. We try and give fans content in exchange for their email address. And we have found that email is the most successful way to drive purchase. You know, you can have the engagement through all these other things, but if you want to sell music to fans, the best way to do that is to have that personal conversation with them through email. That's just what, something that we found very successful. So I don't know if, if you've, any of you have had experiences of you know, have, have, how many of you have left email addresses in exchange for something? You know, when you go into it, yeah, we, you know, we've all done it. You walk into Urban Outfitters or whatever and they're like, oh, do you want to... It, it, they do that. We all do it because that's what works. Um, so if, you know, if anyone is out there has ideas on how we can do that at Sony, we would love to hear from, from you, so... Just call me, <laughs> but because the you know the experience is it, it 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 it's amazing to me that there's nothing out there that does that in a really easy way. You know, it's still quite clunky, and any of the apps that that are out there tend to kind of you you know you you click back and then you're back on the my back on the Facebook page. Where am I? I left my email address. I have no idea. I didn't get a confirmation email. So I think that's a really interesting opportunity for all of us. So for those of you that are interested in music marketing or PR, this sort of D to F, direct to fan, is a conversation that started a couple of years ago and it's still very much alive, very much in play, as you can hear. Um, I'm on the opposite end of the spectrum, um, working with bands that are just emerging. Maybe they only have 100 names on their email address. Very different from, say, a Michael Jackson, um, where you have millions of rabid fans. But again, all the tools that we use at our company all point to this. It's how do we get as many real email addresses, real names, real fans, how do I, we identify them? How does that translate into radio and what you're doing? Clearly you're building a platform around yourself, Lily, and around your curation, now you're writing. Does this come into play for you as a, I want to say persona, DJ? Well, weirdly, I mean, I know basically I got a radio show because of, of me being a blogger. So it's kind of like primarily I feel like I'm a fan of, you know, the artists that I'm playing. Um, and I found that with Bandcamp, when I kind of found certain people in Bandcamp, you had to give your email address in order to get a download. So, which I think is a really clever way because most of the music's free. So it's kind of like a fair trade off, you know, you're getting free music, you're giving them your email address. But it also means that you kind of get a push whenever, whenever they release something, you're one of the first people to find out. 
So I think that, that also it, it builds the kind of inclusiveness of the artist as well and their following. Um, but th then at the same time, not everyone uses Bandcamp. So it's kind of like maybe if there was like a SoundCloud equivalent. Who uses Bandcamp? Hands. Anyone? One, two. <laughs> anyone? Have you guys heard of Noise Trade? It's wonderful. It's just sort of the same concept. SoundCloud? Who's on SoundCloud? Okay, most of you. Interesting. Um, they push too. You know, yeah. SoundCloud, you do get an email when someone you're following does upload something. And even people um, that submit music to me, they often do it via my SoundCloud. So SoundCloud sends me an email saying this person would like you to check out a song. So that is something that I regularly use just to kind of follow these new artists. But yeah, I feel like that's not really the same thing. You know, I wouldn't really go to that if it was like a 50 cent. I wouldn't, I'd never follow 50 cents Bandcamp because I'd be like, what's he doing on Bandcamp? So right. yeah, so it isn't the same. It's like you say, it's better for an emerging artist, I think. Well, it's interesting. There's different platforms. I mean, everybody's on Twitter, right? Everyone's on YouTube, everyone's on Facebook, but then you have, you know, different varying levels. It would be a little strange for 50 Cent to be on Bandcamp. Um, you know, it's just not the place. So I think you do have to know your place as you're coming up through the ranks. Um, are you only working with artists of sort of the teen, tween, fanatic um, level? So when we when we launched into Alpha, we invited, I think it was Justin Bieber fans on the platform. Mm -hmm. And essentially with Buddy Bounce, before we create an artist's page, you have to have a certain number of requests. So we don't just create a page for everyone. Can I, can I ask how many that is? So at the moment we have 80 artists. Oh, that's it. Oh, no, I mean, sorry, how many requests? How many requests? Yeah. Hmm, so around 10 usually. Around 10 requests and we'll, we'll create the page and then oh. we'll inform the fans on, on Twitter and then create it. Um, but at the moment, for example, with One Direction, we have like 100, I think it's 140 requests for Niall on his own. But we've refused <laughs> to create the page just yet because at the moment it is, it, it is predominantly about the actual artists. You know, so one, we've got a One Direction page. But I was going to say, Neve, is it okay to come in and see you <laughs> next week? <laughs> there you go. Brilliant. Um, no, but, my favorite too, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but certainly that's what we do with Buddy Bounce. So obviously um, what we do is, you know, we gamify your fan experience, but then we work together with the artists um, and their teams to actually create and incentivize fans to kind of join the page. So it might be a meet and greet, maybe, you know, for example, with Conor Maynard, we did a meet and greet for some of his fans in France and in Italy, and they had to come onto Buddy Bounce, and it was, I think, the top fan or something got to actually meet Conor. And so that incentivizes them to actually come in, connect their account to see what their score is, but also obviously give their email address. And then on the other side, uh, with the dashboard, you're able to actually, as well as having that email address, understand a bit more about the fans that you've got. So you can take the email address and the mailers a little a step further by actually sending more targeted um, emails. Because if you know that this person's got a viewer badge, they're you know actively on YouTube. Maybe you can actually give them first sample of your next, sorry, first watch of your next YouTube video. And so you're incentivizing them, but also um, helping to kind of market um, whatever it is that your you know that your new video, or whatever. And obviously, by giving that to to a really engaged fan, they are, um, who's also in influential, you're going to get a lot more reach without having to spend the money to do so. So. Yeah, so to answer your question, we're, we're taking, with Buddy Bounce, we're taking the email addresses a step further and actually allowing you to have actionable insights with your targeting. So um, again, this, this bizarre topic of sort of emerging business models for, for artists and musicians, I'd like to, to turn it back to the other side. So if you are interested in being in the music industry, um, where do you see opportunity for for people that want to support artists and support bands and get into the business, um, I'm of the mindset that there's never been a more exciting time to work in this business if you have ideas that people want um, and if you have something that's innovative. And I think you can always make your own economy. Um, it's a little harder in music than I think in, in any other place. We were beginning to talk about just how many apps we've all seen come and go, either the hot flavor of the year that disappears six months later, and a sort of the crushing reality that people didn't really want them anyway, or something better came along that sort of put it out of business. Um, so I'd love to, to hear from you about, A, if you were trying to get into the industry, where do you think a good, healthy, emerging spot 
to put your butt would be. And then B, um, what would you caution or what would you, let's just to go with that and then we'll do part B after this. Emerging, emerging job opportunities. At Sony, we have seen some great app ideas and we've also seen music services come and go. So when I look at what, like I said, I said in my, before you, Spotify, iTunes, Vivo, you have to know your audience. You have to understand what need is being met by uh, your idea. So what need is being met and, and, and how is that need not being met already elsewhere? Because if it is, then it's going to be much more difficult for you to um, launch into that market. And then the other thing is, how, how do you create demand for this thing? Because we get a lot of people coming in, they say, I've got this great idea for an app and it's fantastic and it does X, Y, and Z. And we think, yeah, that, that sounds, you, you know, you really, you obviously, it's something that you really want and you feel really passionate about this idea, but how are you going to create demand? Um, and something we do at Sony, which we're very good at, is identifying audiences, knowing our audiences. We invest heavily in research and insight and our research and insight team are there for people who have ideas. If you have an idea for a music app, come and see us and we will introduce you to our inside team and we can research whether this is something that music fans want. Um, yeah, does that? Yeah, th totally. There's something, um, there's something I'd like to add to that because um, you were right. So it's the, the first thing you need to start with when setting up a, a new uh, music service, considering there's so many of them out there already, is to satisfy a need that, that the audience have. Um, and then creating the demand. But also, you can always um, try and fix the same need that people have had for ages, but come up with a creative solution to that need. So for example, I think, in, in the case of Mixcloud, it's a combination of these two things that happened that made us survive um, and that made us still be out there. Uh, so for one, we kind of helped people who wanted to dig up mixes um, easily, share it with their friends. Like about before Mixcloud, the only way you could find mixes was through illegal manners so we kind of fixed that issue as well we fought a lot um, actually the legal aspect of the business was one of the most difficult uh, parts that we had to fix um, and thank God that happened <laughs> uh, and then from a technical perspective we have an amazing team of people uh, constantly working on improving it uh, so I think we're pretty much there as well but what we did is we saw people, we saw people passionate about radio, passionate about DJ mixes uh, and about extended audio as we call it. And we came up with a product that allowed them to access that content in a legal way so that everybody could uh, access it freely no matter where they are, no matter who they work for, uh, no matter what they do. You want to add to that? Um. No. <laughs> I feel like Mixcloud is kind of it's an essential uh, kind of app or site, which however you use it, because of the fact that there wasn't really anything that was kind of catering to the radio and, and DJ scene before. Because like that's the thing about SoundCloud, Mixcloud, and all the apps there are, they have to be kind of an essential, you know, way of listening to music and stuff. And like with Mixcloud, you can actually like I have my own Mixcloud, you know, page and. <laughs> Uh, you know, you timestamp all the songs, and I feel that that for me, it's like if you're listening to my show, that's probably the best way to do it. Even though I obviously push everyone to the Rinse website, I have a mixed cloud too because <laughs> I just think like a lot of people maybe don't want to listen to the full two hours, or maybe they just want to see what I played. So it's a it's a, a different way to listen to it, and I think that that's the problem with you know the way that things survive these days. If there isn't an essential need for it, then like you say, there's a million apps out there doing very similar things. But what makes that kind of stand out and make it like the one that you have to have? So. Well, I often, in my book, I talk about this. I say, you know, you want to feed people as a marketer or as a, as a band. You want to feed people where they want to eat, right? So, uh, you know, I'm personally, Twitter is my social media drug of choice. And that's where if you want to get a hold of me at CyberPR, I'll answer you 100% of the time. Leave me a message on Facebook. It might take seven days till I even get through the glut on my inbox. So you have to remember as a marketer that 
yes, exactly. Someone might not be listening to you in the format that is the most ideal for your business, but they might be wanting to watch you on YouTube or you know, stream you on something else. So there is that. And as a marketer and as a developer, you want to never exclude things. And I think that's another reason why we see failure so often in new apps is that they don't get the, the pickup and the agreement. Yeah, I was just going to add, um, people, the biggest change that's happened in, 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 since 2006, since downloading um, happened, is that people aren't browsing and buying in the same place anymore. So in the old days, you went into a record store and you browsed. And quite often, you walked out of there with music that you hadn't intended on buying. You had like an impulse purchase because you're browsing. Now people are browsing on YouTube. They're browsing on Mixcloud. They're browsing on Tumblr. They're browsing in all these different places for music. And we have to be there because the buying is happening on iTunes or the buying is or the streaming is happening on Spotify. People go into iTunes because they know what they want to buy and they don't necessarily do their browsing there. So I think that's really important, you know, just to follow on from your point, Lily, that, you know, how can we create opportunities for people to buy where they're browsing and that doesn't currently really exist. I mean, there are ways, there's uh, integrations with uh, iTunes in, in Facebook uh, tabs and you know, that helps a little. So people who are on a Facebook page can actually buy straight off the Facebook page from iTunes. But, you know, that how can we, is there a way for us to replicate that browsing and buying experience? Maybe there isn't, but that would be really interesting for us and for our artists if we could find a way of doing that. And then I just want to add to that before we open up the floor to questions. It's also not only about browsing and buying, but I think I talk to a lot of frustrated artists who are really upset. I'm not selling enough. I'm not selling anything. I can't seem to sell my stuff. And I'm like, okay, well, where are you marketing? Facebook. Okay, when was the last time you went to Facebook with your credit card out ready to buy? That's just not where people buy. People don't buy on Twitter. So, hey, buy my stuff, hey, buy my stuff is not an appropriate message if you're not in the place where people are purchasing. And I see that as a misalignment consistently. Um, I have one last question for you guys about monetizing. Um, do you have any techniques or do you look at how um, you, can, you can monetize from Spotify? Or is it just that ship sailed and that's how people are going to digest music? They're going to stream it, they're going to listen to it, and maybe they're not going to become buyers. Well, um there's, there's a general trend uh, out there now that people stop buying and they started streaming a lot more. It's not to say that they're, they're not buying at all. They're still buying, but they are a lot more cautious about it. So before making the purchase, I think they're, they're going through this... Um, curator sort of stage um, and on Mixcloud for example we help bridge th those two worlds uh, with an integration that we have with an app called Juno so um, if everybody on Mixcloud uh, track adds their track list um, or not we have this integration with Juno that automatically uh, tries to recognize the tracks that have been used in a mix of course we advise everybody to manually uh, input it because um, the, the automatic uh, engine is not 100% accurate. So whenever that happens, uh, there's a buy link next to the, the name of the track so that people can go on Juno download and, and purchase the track. So I think there should be a lot more um, of this sort of integrations happening between platforms where you can stream as well as purchase. Uh, I'm not sure if, if Spotify... I stopped being a Spotify user a while ago. <laughs> they don't have their, their integration anymore. They, right, so they it's... Focus on, they know their audience. They know their customers. Their customers want to stream music. Um, you can't hear you. Sorry. Oh, yes. I was, yeah, Spotify don't have a, a download to own um, component to their platform, as you know. They, they, they know their customers very well. Um, they, they, they offer a streaming service, and obviously... Uh, you know, my own personal experience. I was telling um, Andrea earlier. I uh, follow. I have a Mixcloud. You know, I follow uh, two Brooklyn radio stations on Mixcloud, and I buy music because it, it helps me discover new music. And so that's the experience I have. And we, from listening to fans, that is the experience that they discover. As I said, the browsing and the buying is just happening in different places. Okay, we've got 15 minutes. We'd love to open it up to questions if you guys have any, guys and gals. 
girls, ladies and gents. Man in the red. No, lady in the blue. Hi. Hi. Um, my question is sort of not really to do much with technology and sort of what you guys have been talking about, more, more, more about you personally um, and obviously as a female. Um, I wanted to know what you did before you got the jobs or the roles that you're in now. It, have you always wanted to be into music? Um, if so, sort of how did you get into it? And also, um, it's sort of two parts to the question. Um, the second part is more along the lines of um, you as individuals. So is music something you always wanted to do? Or was it something that you had a passion about? Or, or, but, but you had like other passions sort of in different industries? And how did you make come to that decision that this is what I wanted to do and you know, stuck by it, essentially. Does that make sense? It sure does. does. Cool, shall I start? Yes. I, I, I'm probably the less, the least musical person here. <laughs> um, I actually don't have a background in music. Um, I was a geek when I was young, and um, I accidentally stumbled into startups to begin with. Um, after I graduated from media, multimedia and communications here in London, uh, I kind of found um, a startup called Internships uh, that helped me um, grow in the tech industry. And then through tech, I managed to uh, find the people who founded Mixcloud. And Mixcloud kind of bridged all my passions together because I've always had my my toes dipped into a lot of music pi musical pies, to say that. Uh, either, you know, like mostly event management, festivals and that sort of stuff, but never as a musician myself or as a DJ or as a, as a radio presenter. So uh, I guess it was a bit of a happy coincidence for me. I uh, wanted to be a journalist and I wasn't good enough at writing. So I went to work for a music magazine in Ireland called Top Press Magazine. And um, I wasn't good enough to be a journalist, but they offered me a job in the promotions department. And I worked there for two years. And then I stayed in publishing for quite a long time. And I worked for newspapers and magazines. So I kind of went down the marketing route. Um, my degree was in arts and journalism. So I, you know, I, I, I have learned on the job. I now, you know, I now responsible for all of the digital marketing at Sony. I didn't start doing digital marketing. I started doing traditional marketing, and I worked my way up. And then I worked for HMV, um, uh, and I came from HMV to Sony. Wait. So, okay. So, so when did you realize that the writing was on the wall, and you had to? How did you teach yourself digital? Did HMV say get with this? How did you come to that? Well, uh, HMV just realized in around, way too late, in around 2008, that they should launch uh, a digital music service. And they actually had an amazing music service called HMV Unlimited, which predated Spotify by about three years. Mm -hmm. But they didn't invest in it, and they and they didn't quite know. You know, their, their real, their key, you know, their, their stores were their uh, crown jewels, and, and so they didn't invest. But I, I uh, somebody went on maternity leave, and <laughs> my, the e-commerce director said, you know, if you don't do this, maternity cover you're going to be stuck doing marketing managing Ireland for the rest of your life and you should do this and I said well what if I what if she comes back from maternity leave which she did but you know then I, I took the risk and I learned you know in a kind of a low risk area where HMV Unlimited was you know our, our marketing budget was 20,000 pounds at the time so I could make mistakes and it wasn't uh, so I, I guess my advice would be you know, I, I was I wanted to be a journalist. All I knew about was music. I wasn't a good enough journalist, but that got me into music. So focus on what you know and find out as much as you can about what you know. And you you, you know, p people, any industry will want you if you are knowledgeable in in that area. So I would yeah. And and obviously, there's lots of women who are role models now in in digital. My, I have a team of 30, and 28 of them are women. Yes, I love that. So. I think women are predisposed to being really, really good at social media because they're really good at multitasking. Um, <laughs> you know, we chat all the time. Yeah. I, I want to get to other questions, but please do come see us. Um, we're both entrepreneurs. All three of us are entrepreneurs, and probably have something to say about that. Hello, I am Gustavo. I come from a country that the people don't spend so much money or no. A lot of people don't purchase music. Mm -hmm. 
So the first question will be like for the Sony, for example, how much is a lead in the industry for Sony? If I get you somebody who I know that is exposed to your music in locals, in bars and clubs, and, and um, buy four or five albums or 20 iTunes songs, how, how much is a lead there? And, a, a lead. Yeah, a lead for... A lead, sorry. I, I have a company and then I sell you the, my leads. That pe uh, well, email I mean address, lead generation. Yeah. Do you mean referrals? Exactly. Ah, okay. So Th what your question is... You mean you bands and I, I come from an other industry that the leads are from automotive industry. The uh, leads are really, really expensive. Right. So now for the music industry, yeah. I want to know how little it is or how big it is compared to automotive. So, so I mean... I, I I don't think anybody would would I I can't share the affiliate programs that we have with you. I mean, I could talk to you about it afterwards if you want, but the we have referral programs with all of our retailers, um, and you know it it's it is what it is. It's uh, it's definitely a way for us to understand more about how effective our advertising is, because if we look at the lead you know the the affiliate schemes and the reports we get from the affiliate schemes we can really the value is in understanding the value of the click on that ad and i mean not necessarily the revenue from that lead but how you know how and where the return on investment is happening so it's valuable to us from that perspective okay can i ask another question i'd, I'd love to move around we've got sorry only five more minutes sorry. Question, actually. sorry i just wanted to yeah, continue on from that. Is it an open program? Can anybody uh, apply to kind of join the affiliate program or is it just open to? We have an affiliate program with retailers. Right. There's no program, as far as I'm aware, that exists where we would pay for a referral. Pardon? Yeah, no. But it's an interesting question. The value, f the value for me as a digital marketing person is in the, you know, the effectiveness of the advertising rather than the value of the commission we make on the, the lead. If, does that make sense? Is that, does that, yeah. Hi, um, my name's Guy. I've got a background in music. and I've done a lot of stuff in live and recording and working with a lot of artists, including social media. I'm just interested to know from all of your perspectives, firstly, is the waiting on selling music as to what the future of the music industry is the right thing that we're talking about here? Or, or are there other means by which we're monetizing the industry, which is really where the focus should be? Uh, I guess I'd like your inputs on where you think the future revenues are going to come from uh, if we make the assumption that sales aren't where the, where the money is? I mean, I'll chime in here. I think nothing ever replaces a live music experience. I think you can just, you see it over and over and over, and we're seeing higher and higher ticket prices. We're seeing people doing VIP clubs and spending insane amounts of money because of that personal live experience. So as long as artists connect to people, in, a, in, a, in world 1.0, I think that that's always going to be an emerging place. And I think as you know, we're huge niche marketers, niche marketers, that's what we do at my firm, what we're constantly seeing is a, a major point of, of where our artists make money is very few fans, but each one of those fans parting with a large amount of money, which ends up being a sustainable business model for our artists. It takes a little bit of savvy to do that, but I would say that's a tremendous growth area. Yeah, I was just going to say, I think, I guess it depends on the artist as well. With, with signed artists to the majors, y y I guess you're kind of seeing them kind of becoming more and more like brands in themselves, being able to command you know, quite a, quite huge sums from brands um, by partnering with brands. You know, uh, recently you've seen Conor Maynard partnering with Coca-Cola um, and other artists doing that kind of thing. And I guess for smaller artists, if you aren't, if you haven't got an advance from being on a label and having that kind of um, all that, you know, the support that comes with that, then you've got to look at other ways and maybe I don't know licensing. I don't know if that's a could potentially be a lucrative market if you've got the right kind of I guess, music and, and access to companies who want to kind of license that or you know other 
other means. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. of course. Um, something that I find really interesting is, of course, the, like like live performances are one of the most important things. But I think, I mean, I work in kind of hip hop, which is, I mean, a lot of industries are like this. But I think that hip hop has a real strong like merchandise angle and like the kind of clothing side of it, especially. Uh, there are lots of people who, I mean, Odd Future are with Sony. But it's, I mean, Sony is obviously they're kind of, they have an imprint with them. But Tyler, the creator, he's actually got a song lyric about selling like a quarter of a million pairs of socks, uh, dollars that is, yeah. So he's managed to make a quarter of a million from selling socks. And I think that, I mean, there's like all kinds of elements to his branding and his merchandise, but to think that he's done that with just one part of it. And um, I think like there's a lot of unsigned acts that are actually using merchandise as the kind of arm for them. Uh, Flatbush Zombies, who are, are an unsigned act from Brooklyn, they've actually just teamed up with Stussy. So they've actually got a collection of t-shirts. So it is actually a really strong emerging model, I think, in terms of hip hop and a lot of kind of genres outside of that too. And I'm from Brooklyn and I've never heard of it. So there you go. They're amazing. amazing. Cool. <laughs> Last burning question of the day. Make it good. Anyone? No one. I've scared you all. Thank you very much.